Good morning and Happy New Year. I count it a privilege today to bring God's Word to you um, and provide Pastor Corey with what I was going to say was an opportunity for some R&R, but he's just taking a pause this first service. And so it's a privilege that I have to share that with you today. Last week, Pastor Corey shared the message about the Magi presenting the gifts to the baby Messiah, Joseph and Mary, and how that immediately thereafter, gold, frankincense, and myrrh had come their way. And the next thing you know, Herod's after them to kill the baby Messiah, and they have to flee to Egypt in exile and all of the upheaval that that brings. He applied that to our lives in that after sometimes great blessings and benefits and progress that occurs in our spiritual lives, something or a bunch of things seems to go horrifically wrong. And yet, the message, the application that came to us, God works through those things. His glory is still accomplished and God remains at work in our lives. This week, we're going to turn to the book of Philippians for just a few uh, minutes to, to check out a time where Paul is actually living out the reality of what Pastor Corey preached last week. He's in chains. He's in prison. He doesn't have the freedom that he had had before, but he continues to live out God's word through him, and we're going to be looking at that today. Now, the book of Philippians is known as the favorite epistle, perhaps even the favorite book, in the favorite book, the Bible. How many of you share that sentiment that Philippians is your favorite book of the Bible? Who would you, what book would you say? Some would say Psalms. All right, Psalms and others. But a poll that was done a number of years ago of 20, over 2,500 adults found that most people agree on this one thing, the Bible is the favorite book of all books. And that is good to, to hear. But what was fascinating is they followed up with that in, in, in more of a poll. And they asked the, the uh, survey people, name one of the Gospels. Who can name a Gospel? John. Okay, I just figured John would be the first one mentioned. Is there any more? <laughs> Did you know that 50% of American adults missed even naming one gospel? Their favorite book of all is the Bible, but another question, who can answer this one? What's the first book in the Bible? Did you know that only 50% of the adults got it? How about this quiz? I just love quizzes. I can tell you're into it too. Where was Jesus born? Well, now we should know that one because we just celebrated his birth in Bethlehem. But did you know that um, 60% of the evangelicals said that Jesus was born in uh, Jerusalem? Okay, another quiz question. Where was Jesus crucified? Golgotha would be the most specific answer. What city is Golgotha near? What? Jerusalem. Uh, only seven, um, let's see, 17% of high school students said that Jesus was crucified on the road to Damascus. Who was Moses? 22% of high school students said one of Jesus' 12 apostles, or maybe an Egyptian pharaoh, or maybe an angel. So we need to work on who Moses is. How about Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you know who or what? That is, 50% of the high school seniors thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were a married couple. <laughs> Another one that really caught a lot of people, who is Noah's wife? What is the name of Noah's wife? Now, when I first looked at that question, instantly popped into my mind the answer, Zipporah. But then when I checked a little bit closer, I found out that that was not correct that Noah's wife was not Sephora, that was Moses' wife. Anybody got an answer to that? Who is Noah's wife? Mrs. Noah. <laughs> 10% of the people in the United States said that Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. <laughs> and now this is a really, really tough one. Who can name five of the Ten Commandments? Do you know that... Uh, 
60% of Americans did, could not name five of the Ten Commandments. So, we've got a little work to do in our most favorite book of all books. And our goal here at River Oak Grace is to equip one another, to equip us, to let God's Word flow through us to make a difference in the world that is around us. And some special ministries are continuing to take place to cause that to occur. The prayer wall over there that uh, Pastor Corey mentioned earlier, in a couple weeks he's going to tell us about how we can specifically pray for our loved ones that they would come to know Jesus Christ and the word of God can flow through us to them. Also, you saw there in the announcements in the bulletin as well as Pastor Corey that in, in a week from Tuesday night, Epic begins again and we have that opportunity to learn, be discipled, be equipped to share God's word that his word would flow through us. And so, we're going to take a look today at a situation that Paul is in as the word of God flows through him through, in a difficult situation. So, let's look at Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to begin with reading with verse 12. If you have your Bible or your electronic device and want to open that up to Philippians chapter 1, or it will be here on the screen. I want you to know, brothers, Paul writes, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my, that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. As Paul launches this book of Philippians, he lets the people know of his current situation, what he is dealing with. And he puts it in perspective as to why his life matters and what is going on through, that Christ is doing through him in that circumstance. Now, we've been going through some stuff, too, around here, haven't we? Past couple of years have been different than anything most of us have ever known. But some of us would say, well, it hasn't just been the past couple of years. It's been the last couple of decades or so that life has had its times of upheaval. And so as we begin 2022, and I never imagined I would see 2022 because I figured Jesus would have come a long, long time ago. But... We're still here, and he's still there. So as we look at the beginning of 2022, I believe this would be a great time for us to evaluate our situation and look ahead as to what God would have for us. So what is Paul's situation? He is in house arrest. He had to rent the house himself. Chained to Roman guards 24-7. But despite that, Paul shares with us that he continues proclaiming the gospel amid opposition. We're going to have the acrostic today of proclaim. This could be a while, couldn't it? He finds that he is continuing, even in that circumstance, proclaiming the gospel amidst opposition. Christianity had begun as a subversive, impugned, and despised new thing. The change Jesus' followers introduced was met with rejection by the mainstream of society, and Jesus had warned of that. He told them they would face persecution. And Jesus was not exaggerating. Not only was Paul accepting persecution as the status quo, in his perspective, he was seeing its value. Specifically, he was rethinking the life of a witness. He was a witness. When we think of the word witness, if we are into cop shows or anything like, like that much at all, we think of witness protection. Because a person who has witnessed a crime often is endangered by those who are accused. And so to protect them, 
before they can give their testimony or even after they've given their testimony, a witness protection system is in place. The word witness that is used here is similar from that concept because it can also be translated as martyrs. The Greek word for witness is also the word that is translated martyrs. If we were to read Acts 1-8, putting the word martyrs in there, Jesus would have said, you will be my martyrs in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, to use the word martyr every time that Greek word shows up in the Greek would not provide an accurate translation. So it's, in, it's inappropriate to put that in there every time. However, the statement remains true. I imagine if somebody had sat down and talked to Paul, he would say, say, Paul, have there been any martyrs in Jerusalem? Oh, yeah, he'd probably name a few. How about in Judea? Yes. What about Samaria? Yes. What about those various places in the world? Have there been any martyrs? I suspect that Paul could have named a martyr in every one of those situations, even if we had translated that scripture that way. In fact, I remember hearing the story some years ago that Jim Daly, who's the president of Focus on the Family, tells of an incident when he visited China to encourage the Christians there. As some Chinese Christians were, were taking him to the airport to return to America, they mentioned to him, we're praying for the church in America. And so rather than just say, well, thank you, we appreciate your prayers, we're praying for you as well, uh, Jim Daly decided to say and ask them, so tell me, how do you pray for the church in America? And it's, he says their expression changed a little bit like the little child whose hand was caught in the cookie jar. Because sheepishly, they replied to him, well, we're actually praying for greater persecution for the church in America. Because from where we sit, you seem very weak. <laughs> if I'd have been Jim Daylight, I'd have said, well, thanks a lot. But then he probably was, you know, cooler than I am in lots of ways. But it appears that the prayers of the Chinese Christians for us may be answering, becoming answered. And China may have had something to do with that as our system and our society is looking more and more like we're going to be witnesses of a different kind than we've had the opportunity to be for some time. Paul concluded by his own personal experience that Despite that, opposition may mean success and blessing, not failure and consequences. I believe this was the reason the Chinese Christians were praying for us in that way, as they recognized that opposition may mean success and blessing, not failure and consequences. Paul's overt, his outgoing, his dynamic endeavors to win the world for Christ landed him there in prison. He'd been successful and remains known as the greatest missionary of all time. Paul discovered firsthand that opposition and persecution often strengthen believers to proclaim the gospel courageously and fearlessly, while those soft and weak believers who have faced no significant resistance hardly ever share their faith. Well, I'm not asking for you to start praying for persecution, at least not my direction. You know, I'm just not into that. But we do pray, don't we, quite often, Father? Your will be done, your kingdom come, your name be praised. If that's to be the case, then it may be that we, like Paul, will have to come to the point of celebrating chains and difficult circumstances. Here again, what Paul said there in verse 12. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, isn't that interesting? Usually when we see somebody suffer consequences for what they're doing, we think, well, I'm not going to do that. But there was something about the dynamism of Paul's faith and Paul's life and the message he was proclaiming that he was in a position to actually celebrate the chains and the circumstances because of the benefit that was happening. So what's really going on? T tell me a little bit more about Paul, maybe you're saying. Many scholars believe that Acts 28, the last book, the last chapter in the book of, of Acts, 
describes Paul's situation where he wrote to, when he was writing to the Philippians. When we got to Rome, Acts says, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a guard, with a soldier to guard him. And John MacArthur describes his situation this way, that Paul was not put in a common prison. He wasn't really a security risk. There weren't any genuine crimes against him. In fact, those that had interrogated him said, you know, there's really no reason to keep him, but he became a political prisoner. That's basically what it turned out to be. There were enough people that were a, a, in opposition to him that they, that they put so much pressure on the, the government and on the leaders that Paul said, look, either set me free or convict me, and if you're not going to do that, I appeal to Caesar. I'm going to go to all the, to the man at the very top, and either if I'm guilty, I'm guilty. If I'm innocent, I'm innocent, but I'm going all the way to the top. And so he made it today to Rome. He had to rent his own uh, house where he was in uh, house arrest. They put a soldier with him 24-7. In fact, John MacArthur says that there would be four soldiers, that every six hours, a different soldier would take the place, and they would actually chain themselves to him. I was a political prisoner there in, in, uh, in Rome waiting for Caesar to see him. Acts 28, 20 tells of his chains. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. And he continues there in verse 30 of Acts 28. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So there in that rented house, in house arrest, with soldiers chained to him, Paul had the opportunity for people to come and hear the gospel and write letters and make the difference in the world that we have come to know and love and understand and receive through all of these uh, centuries and millennia. So who were these soldiers? Now, in our scripture, in the English Standard Version, it says that they were the Imperial Guard. In the New American Standard, it's translated this way, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorium Guard and to everyone else. Now, some of you don't care too much for history, but I'm going to give you a little bit. Hang on just for a minute. Who are the Praetorian Guard? They were the elite forces. That, that's like the, the, the Army Rangers or uh, the, what we used to call the Green Berets or the Navy SEALs, you know, those, those elite officers that the Caesars had put in place to personally guard them as well as to have the greatest influence in that community uh, because they would represent him in a very significant way. In fact, Roman history informs us that the Praetorian Guard became, that, became so powerful that they became the people who actually chose the Caesars. If you had the Praetorian Guard on your side, you had a better opportunity of becoming Caesar. And if you didn't, you had an opposition that would make it impossible for you to have that position. Now, why would you put a Navy SEAL or an Army Ranger chained to the Apostle Paul, this little guy, he was not big at all, not that young, and he'd been beat up a lot, so he wasn't all that healthy. Why would you put the SEALs or the Rangers as the guards for Paul? He wasn't a security risk. He wasn't going to be going anywhere. The friends that came to him weren't coming with swords and spears and lances and all of those sort of things. Why would you put those kind of officers guarding Paul? I love to try to think through things like that. And, of course, the answer that I can tell you definitively is we don't know. So I like to imagine what could it have been. Well, I suspect that in the beginning when he was under house arrest, that they found some soldier that would otherwise have been have washed out of the military, like Gomer Pyle. And so he had four Gomer Piles chained to him for a while. But these cool people that were coming and meeting with Paul and sharing the faith and, and, and all of that excitement, as those Gomer Piles went back to the barracks or wherever else they went, they began to tell about this weird prisoner that they were guarding, this Pharisee Jew, this Roman citizen, this, well, political prisoner, that he's really something else. And he's telling us about this amazing person that died and resurrected, and there's these miracles taking place. This is amazing, this guy that I'm guarding. 
And so as the word gets out, I'm making all of this up. Remember, do not put this down as history. This is Phil's imagination. And as the word gets out to these, to these other soldiers and it goes up the, the ranks, some of these big shots think, hey, I want in on the action. That sounds like a plum assignment. Hey, Gomer, I want you out there. You know, you've got KP duty. I'm going to go with that Paul dude. And next thing you know, it's the Praetorium Guard that is guarding Paul. Now, again, I made all that up. All I know is it says that they were the ones guarding him. Now, what do you think? If you, for four hours every day, were chained to the Apostle Paul, and people were coming, and he was writing letters, and he's sharing the gospel, and you're seeing his life, and you're getting acquainted with what he's all about, how long would you stay a non-believer? I believe these guys started coming to Christ. Becoming believers. In fact, the Bible even says that he, he, he writes to those that the believers of Caesar's household. I, I'm wondering as he began to evangelize everybody that was coming, those soldiers began to, to be saved too. And wouldn't it be something that when, when Constantine became the emperor of Rome in 300 uh, AD, that uh, because the Praetorian Guard that were direct descendants of these might have been the ones that influenced him to come to Christ. You see, by godly insight, Paul was already envisioning a long view of the proclamation of the gospel. He was in that situation where these guards there, the opposition that, come, that was coming his way, he was beginning to realize God's going to do something through this, and it doesn't all have to happen this year. One of the neatest things about serving with Pastor Corey is that he has a long view of the ministry and the mission and the vision of River Oak Grace. But one of the really cool things about working with him is it doesn't all have to get done yesterday. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. I seriously mean that. He gives us the time and the opportunity to process through things. Now, we got to keep moving, but it doesn't all have to happen yesterday. And as Paul had a long view of the gospel, he realized that something was going to happen. Something was already happening, and I am convinced that believers were coming to faith as a result of being chained to Paul. But let's look at it a little closer this very book, the book of Philippians, started out as a thank you note. He was just writing a thank you note. The Philippians had sent money to pay for the rent. And they'd also sent along one of the disciples there to care for him. And kind of, you know, maybe he was going to be the secretary. Maybe he was going to be the appointment calendar person. Or maybe he was just going to be the gopher that helped out with whatever needed to be done. They not only sent rent money so that he could have his, uh, a house that he was arrested in his house arrest but they were also they also sent along Titus to care for him what started out as a thank you note became this magnificent book of Philippians isn't that amazing it's kind of like this again my imagination Paul sits down thank you Philippians for your kindness to da 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 and then the next thing you know poof the book of Philippians shows up as the most favorite epistle of all people so I made a little application of that. You know, it's really kind of amazing what God can do when we just kind of feel impressed to do something kind for his people, for the church. You know, we, we come and all of a sudden, you know, you know I, I think I'm going to double what I've put in the offering today. Or I'm going to drop a special donation in the, book, in the uh, little brown box back there. Or I'm going to send that, that check or do, I'm going to try out that online giving. Let's see, how much should I put? A eh, hundred 150, 200, whatever it was. And, and just, we decide to give. And we're just giving like the Philippians did. It's, it's going to help. But we don't realize somehow the extent to which God can multiply that. That what started out as a simple thank you note became this amazing epistle that we get to enjoy and that I'm sharing with you today. 
Can you imagine what God can accomplish through our devotion and our dedicated service if we will allow him to do it through us? What can God do with our willingness to properly handle difficult situations when we face Christ rejectors, when we face those who would oppress us and persecute us? What can God do when not only we are giving, but we are serving as he would have us to? You know, it's bad enough to deal with those who are in opposition to the faith. They make fun of us for believing in Jesus. They make fun of us for denying ourselves of certain things because he's told us to be holy and faithful before him. But Paul realizes and experiences that it's not only the Christ rejectors that create prob problems for believers, but sometimes opposition comes from ambitious antagonists. And this is the way he describes them. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry and preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. Paul says, one of the problems I'm facing is those ambitious antagonists who are also preachers of the gospel. Wars with fellow believers hit us harder than wars that we have with those that are outside the faith. Those that have rejected Christ and denied Christ and live perverted lives, we can sort of handle their opposition and their persecution. I mean, it's par for the course. But what happens when it's one of our fellow believers? What happens is when it's somebody that we've enjoyed fellowship with for a long period of time? What happens when someone that we've linked in ministry with and then they turn against us? What then? I remember decades ago when I was much younger, I heard Bill Gaither quote a, a little rhyme that I have quoted many times since then. It kind of goes like this. To dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. To live below with saints we know, now that's another story. But Paul's long view perspective caused him to no longer let those guys bother him. His goal of living to proclaim the gospel empowered him to arise above, to rise above those detractors as well. Now, we're not talking about heretics. We're not talking about those who no longer teach the faith in a proper way. Paul had no problem blasting them. We're not talk talking about those that, that are living out immoral lives. Paul had no problem calling them to repent. Uh, he, he, he would let them have it. But he's dealing with men now that because of their humanness, because of their egos, because of their desires for personal advancement, they're taking advantage of Paul's situation and they're looking down on him. Their messages might be as accurate as Paul's was, but their attitudes were far, far different. These are the kind of people that in conversations every once in a while will just kind of come up that they will say, well, you know, you've got to look out for number one. And no sooner does it come out of their mouth until they kind of catch themselves, well, well, you know, Christ is number one, but, but you've got to look out for yourself as well. You know, number two. But you know and I know that oftentimes when people say you've got to look out for number one, oh, oh, I mean Christ is number one. Christ and they are so close to one that... It, they have a problem because when Christ is number one, we fall in the order much, much farther down. Now, Paul could have just really gone on and on and on about these people and even named names, but instead, he also was thankful and he listed the thankfulness that he had for those allied associates who were kindred spirits. He describes them this way, brothers in the Lord who preach Christ out of goodwill, who do so in love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. These were men who modeled what this epistle promotes. They were men of worthy conduct. They were men of humility. They were men of rejoicing in the Lord. The things we find again and again and again in this most loved epistle of joy that Paul is sharing with us here. Yes, there were these uh, ambitious antagonists, but oh, how pleasant it is to have allied associates that you know you can count on and that they, they can count on you and you can count on them. And they're going to be there as part, as we like to say at Celebrate Recovery, part of the forever family that God has given to us. And so Paul was empowered to ignore personal attacks from self-seeking opportunists who were supposing that they can stir up trouble for him while he is in chains. With those guys, it was personal 
They wanted to exalt themselves at the expense of Paul. They strutted around criticizing and putting Paul down. But Paul would not enter into the fray, for he was making the main thing the main thing. That's another thing that we're really wanting to promote here at River Oak Grace, is that the main thing will be the main thing. He writes this in verse 18. Paul says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Again and again, here in this epistle to the Philippians, Paul will bring us back to this. Stick with the main things. This is one of the most positive epistles. Those self-seeking opportunists might get amazing advancement, but Paul shrugged and said, so what? So what? Christ is proclaimed. People are getting saved. God is glorified. Paul says, I'm going to rejoice right here, right now. Though I'm chained to this rough Roman soldier, rather than whine, I'm going to write this thank you note to those wonderful people in Philippi who have helped me again and again. In fact, this time the Philippian Christians sent even more than the rent money for my house arrest. They sent along with the rent money a special person to do for me what I can't do for myself and what Burley Brutus here, not his real name, my guard won't do for me. So Paul says, what kind of day am I having? Well, God's word is poured out through me. I'm having a great day because guess what? Burley Brutus here, not his real name, just came to faith in Christ. And Paul could lean back and take a moment as he picked up the pen and pause for a second and go, ah, it doesn't get much better than this. Really, Paul? In chains? House arrest? Burley Brutus is next to you all the time? And he had beans for lunch? No, no, no. no. Paul knew the exhilaration of leading people to Christ. We here at River Oak Grace want each and every one of you to have that same exhilaration. We want each and every one of you to have that, that sense of God at work through you and in you that you also lead someone to Christ. In fact, we're going to give you some techniques to make that happen. We're going to, Paul, Pastor Paul, Pastor Paul, Pastor Corey, I got alliteration going there. Pastor Corey, in a week or two, is going to tell us all about that prayer wall right there, how that can be a part of this action. The epic this beginning a week from Tuesday night is another opportunity for us to learn how uh, to, to be equipped to make that difference in the world around us. Here's what Paul said as he concludes this section we have today. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. What if your loved one that doesn't know Jesus and my loved one that doesn't know Jesus will be able to say this because of what we do in their lives? But they may not know it yet, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ, this will turn out for the deliverance of our loved ones. People who are trapped in sin. People who are trapped in doubt. People who are trapped in the horrors of lives walking away from Christ. That we, by God's power and work in our lives, will draw them to him. Through your prayers for your unsaved loved ones, they will receive deliverance from the slavery of sin and come to faith in Christ. There's one more thing we want to do this morning to help us be equipped and empowered to take this message, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And that is something that we do every first Sunday of the month. You see the tables around us, what we call the communion time together. This is a moment of special communion with God. When we receive the bread and the cup, we recognize that Christ is at work in us in a very significant way. Now, some of you are here today, and you go, this is the weirdest message I have ever heard. And this is the weirdest talk I've ever experienced, and I don't know much at all about this. I hope you'll come back so that you can hear more about it, because if I've confused you really badly, this is a great place to get it all straightened out when you come back in the next few weeks. And so you may be thinking this morning, you know, I don't know what this is about, but there's this communion thing coming, and we're going to get up, and we're going to go to the tables, and we're going to get the bread, and we're going to get the cup. If this is all foreign and new to you, you just watch us, observe, and see. I'm going to find out what's going on here before I get in too deep. For those of you here this morning 
that in 22, you want the word of God to really be flowing through you. I want to encourage you to make your way to your tables in a few moments. Take the bread and the cup. And in a very special way of worship before the Lord, receive the bread, the broken body of the Lord. To receive the cup, the blood of Christ. And be empowered. Put somebody on that prayer wall here in a few weeks. Come to Epic. But don't make it all just happen here. Tomorrow, at work, or at school, or neighborhood, or maybe even this afternoon. Recognize that God wants to work through you, to your loved ones and your friends. Would you stand at this point, make your way to the tables, and if you would grab the bread and the cup and return to your places, then together we will receive communion in just a few.